Welcome to Prairie Hub Tech. I'm your host, Jessica Womack. And today we have an amazing episode for you. We're gonna learn about cyber readiness and how you can foolproof your passwords, as well as we'll go to Code Camp with Cipriana Engel, who's a software engineer, and we'll learn all about JavaScript. So, Prairie Hub Tech, who are we? We're here and we're live in Omaha, Nebraska. And Prairie Hub Tech is powered by Go Go Greeny. Go Go Greeny, mom said, eat your greens, is an urban agritech company located here in Omaha, Nebraska. So, thank you for sponsoring us. So, let's talk about cyber hygiene. Just how clean is your password? Well, according to Verizon, 58% a data breaches happen to small businesses. So what is a data breach and how can you keep yourself, your little password safe from hackers? Tip one, choose a password that is 14 characters long. Now those 14 characters and say, Jessica, that's a pretty long password, but there's some science behind it. So when you're looking at your passwords, you wanna make sure that you're using uppercase letters as well as lowercase letters and letters that contain special characters like exclamation, hash, you know, hashtag, password safe. And also you don't want to allow it to contain any personal information. So if your favorite dog is named Rover, you probably shouldn't add that in your password. Tip two, if you are a person that likes to sing along or you have trouble memorizing your passwords, actually what you can do is use a passphrase. A passphrase, you can use song lyrics, so you can say, so glad you made it, or passphrases that are easy to remember, like, wash the dishes. Except for you can change the letters with numbers, and you can also use special characters. Now, passphrases are really unique because with passwords, you have to change them every 90 days. However, with a passphrase, you can keep them for up to a year. Tip three. Do not recycle passwords. Yes, you're supposed to recycle your plastic and your glass, but do not recycle your passwords. Actually, according to research that studied the LinkedIn hack, 6.5 million passwords were stolen. And of those 6.5 million passwords are stolen, many people still use those passwords today for other accounts. So the number one thing you can do is one, never reuse a stolen password or an old password, and two, make sure that you're either using passwords that are 14 characters long or passphrases. And that is our cue for cyber hygiene. All right, so if you think that you have cyber hygiene tips that you wanna share with us, go ahead and hashtag us on Cyber Monday for Cyber Ready in the Prairie. That's hashtag Cyber Ready in the Prairie. And you can follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, as well as Instagram. Okay, so feet on the streets. Yes, we wanna hear from you. We wanna hear from our viewers out there, whether you're in Omaha, Nebraska, or you're in San Francisco. We wanna hear from you. Feet on the street is for you to tell us what you feel. If you wanna hear about something, if you wanna talk about different topics, if you want to say, hey, what's going on with these data breaches, give us information, hit us up on Beat on the Street and you might be featured here. Up next, we have tech support. Tech support, we're going to talk to a local software engineer. Her name is Cipriana Engel and she has amazing information and tips for us about her journey into software development and how you at home can start your journey as well. KPAO Community Television, handmade in Omaha since 2013. Welcome back to Prairie Hub Tech. My name is Jessica Womack and I'm your TV show host today. And with us, we have Cipriana Engel. She is a software engineer. Welcome, Cipriana. Thank you. Woohoo! <laughs> so, Cipriana, thank you for coming on the show today. And I have a question. What does software engineer, what does that mean? What does that title mean? 
Yeah, so it's actually kind of a broad title mm -hmm. in the tech terms. So uh, it can mean back-end engineering, okay. front-end engineering. I mean, there's just a wide array of things right now. Wow. So it's kind of a catch-all. Um, my mm -hmm. particular job that I do is more of web development. Okay, so, that's cool. Yeah, I'm on the UI team, and so okay. a lot of what I work with is in JavaScript. Wow, all right. So when you say UI team, what does that mean? So UI stands mm -hmm. for user interface. User so that, interface. Yep, that is exactly what you're going to be seeing when okay. you visit a website. Awesome. So all those pretty colors and the buttons, you're the person that's behind that. Yes. yes. Not designing it, though. Not designing it. Somebody way better at that <laughs> <laughs> designs the buttons. I just make them sit on the page where they're okay. supposed to. Okay. <laughs> okay. So they're not migrating all over the place. Like, wait, so where's the menu button? Okay. That's right. you. Awesome. <laughs> So how did you arrive at that position today? Uh, yeah, so I have kind of an interesting path into mm -hmm. just software engineering in general and web development. I um, went to school for international relations. Oh, so wow. Completely unrelated. OK, <laughs> let's talk about this too. <laughs> right. Mm. <laughs> So um, international relations, I just started getting into using a programming language called R, okay. um, and that's used for a lot of statistics, and so uh -huh. that kind of sparked my interest into um, learning how to work with data a little bit more, mm -hmm. kind of getting into what SQL is and how data comes together. And so from there, I kind of started taking a more data path oh, wow. um, and learning a little bit about SQL, okay. Python um, at my first job out of school. So mm -hmm. that kind of introduced me. And then I actually came back to Omaha because I was outside of Omaha. And okay. I came back here and I went through Omaha Code School. Oh, that's so fun. Yeah. Wow. Awesome okay. experience. So you went from an international relations student doing R, statistics, then you transformed and then you ended up at Omaha Code School. So Omaha yeah. Code School, is it still here in Omaha? Or tell us a little bit about Omaha Code School. Unfortunately, it is mm -hmm. not anymore. Okay. So the founder, uh, Samit Jain, um, mm -hmm. and some of the other founders um, that were running the school, they moved out of the state. Okay, okay. Uh, but yeah, they had just an amazing program here. They wow. had several cohorts of students go through the school, and many of them are mm -hmm. successful in the tech field now. So That is pretty cool. Yeah. So when you were at the code school, when you were there, did you decide, okay, I'm going to be a software engineer at that point, or did you start learning more about it? Because you said you had interests like a background in Python and R. So, what happened at Omaha Code School to keep you going forward? That's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I wasn't actually sure. I just knew okay. that it was kind of an interest of mine, mm -hmm. um, and it was something that sounded uh, like a challenge. Okay. And so when I got to Omaha Code School, like. <laughs> The first day yeah. we got our assignments and it uh -huh. was so overwhelming and oh, I was like, no. I don't know if this is for me. So. Sure, sure. <laughs> that, yeah, you see a whole bunch of scripts on the page and right. you're like, uh, maybe? I'm oh, not sure. It was overwhelming, mm -hmm. like completely overwhelming. But okay. um, the more I stuck through it and I just liked it more and more because it was that mm -hmm. piece of just like, I felt like I'm really solving a problem. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it was that's like nice. a puzzle coming together and that really just like oh. drives me. I enjoy doing that kind of work. So. Okay, well that sounds really rewarding then. Yeah. So what is the language that you use the most then? So day to day now mm -hmm. is JavaScript. Okay. Yep. So in um, code school, they actually mm -hmm. start teaching you with Ruby. Okay. Um, but I got my first um, actual full time software engineering mm -hmm. job in JavaScript as a web developer. Okay. And when you say JavaScript, for our viewers at home, they're saying, "What? What is that? Is that the thing that I <laughs> press for the update? What does JavaScript mean? What is that?" Yeah, JavaScript is a language that works mm -hmm. in web browsers. Okay. And okay. so it allows you to have an interactive piece with your websites. Oh, that's nice. So it's not necessarily required for any websites mm -hmm. that you see. That's just giving you information. Okay. But it has that interactive piece. So when you cool. click on a button or submit cool. a form, sure. or it's bringing you back a large amount of data, that mm -hmm. is likely being done with JavaScript. Le okay, well, that's good. That's good to know. So when I'm going to a website, and I'm pressing all these buttons, you're making sure they stay in place. Right. I understand that <laughs> JavaScript is behind this. It's working. Okay, that's awesome. So what is the most difficult programming language? We know your day-to-day -day programming, programming language, but what's the most difficult for you? Um, with JavaScript, I feel like one of the most mm -hmm. difficult things there is that it's a constantly changing ecosystem. Oh, really? Um, which also makes it really fun, too. Okay, so sure. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of depends on how you're driven um, okay. as a programmer and as a learner. So huh. 
Um, for me, it's I actually went on maternity leave earlier this uh, year. Oh, and congratulations! So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I was out for mm -hmm. three months, and just in okay. that time span coming back, I felt mm -hmm. like so much had changed within really? the ecosystem that it took me just a couple of days to get back up into speed. Wow, so. that's really fast. Okay, <laughs> right. when you said it moves fast, I'm thinking yeah, every two years there's an update, but three months, and already <laughs> you're seeing changes, and you're like. What does this mean? Okay, wow, that's really interesting yes. insight. So what's your favorite software platform when you're using JavaScript or Ruby or R? What's your favorite platform, period? Um, so one thing that I use mm -hmm. every single day is VS Code. So really? Okay. That's the editor that I write all of my code in, mm. and it's probably the most popular editor out there if you're okay. um, in web development or okay. JavaScript um, programmer. So okay. there's just so many. Um, it's open oh. source. It's oh, run by fun. Microsoft, and okay. there's just so many extensions and different programs mm -hmm. that are included in it that it makes like programming so much faster and oh, easier. Oh, that's good. Yes. Okay, because no one wants to just type away and like is taking forever. It's nice to have <laughs> plugins and know that there's also community behind it too. Exactly. So I'm sure you probably have questions and it's like, oh, just throw it up here on the community. Yep, their okay. documentation is fantastic. Oh, so. really? <laughs> Tell me about this documentation. <laughs> Sometimes documentation for different platforms or softwares, it can be a job in and of itself. So it that's can. good that they have <laughs> nice documentation. Okay. So what are the drawbacks for using either your platform of choice or your programming language of choice? What are some of the negatives behind it? Yeah, that's an excellent question mm -hmm. and one that a lot of people, even developers, don't really think about. Okay. Um, with JavaScript, anytime you're adding mm -hmm. in a scripting language to your browser, mm -hmm. um, there are side effects. So oh. some of the side effects when you add in JavaScript uh -huh. is it's going to slow down your web page. And okay. so if you think about people that are not using the newest iPhones mm -hmm. and trying to access your, your web browser or they're on a slower mm -hmm. connection in, say, a rural area where they don't have 4G connection, okay. you have to think about how much JavaScript you're actually loading on your really? page just to make basic things function. So oh, wow. um, it's important that if you do add in JavaScript, mm -hmm. and most of the time you will because it's just the way the yeah. web works these days, sure. <laughs> Why not? Um, that you should at least have a fallback or have okay. something that shows you, hey, this is still loading. Huh. You know, um, if you're on a slower connection okay. or on a device that maybe doesn't work with certain JavaScript features, because mm -hmm. that happens all the time, yeah. um, then we need to have fallbacks in place. So that's definitely okay. something that we should be considering more mm -hmm. as JavaScript developers. But I would say one of the drawbacks is we really don't consider oh. it as much as we should. Oh, no, someone's <laughs> going to come knocking on your cubicle like, right. oh, this is loading <laughs> too slow. Well, that's really good. I didn't think about that. So when you're designing a website, especially some of our viewers, are wanting to get into coding and web development. So it's really interesting that just thinking of all the different add-ons and if you want to make it super fancy, if you want fireworks to explode, I mean, right. you have to think <laughs> about how long is it going to take for those fireworks to load on the page. So that's a really good insight. Okay, so I have one last question before we wrap it up. And that's any advice that you can give to our viewers that are out there, whether they're children or adults or they're going into their second or third career, What's something that you can tell them, some kind of motivation or advice to help propel them to go into STEM? Um, one thing that I was told um, that I thought was really helpful when mm -hmm. I was just first learning how to program in Ruby and then later on in JavaScript was just mm -hmm. to um, take a very small, sizable project okay. and work on that. Uh -huh. um, don't try to build everything at once because no. it will feel <laughs> overwhelming and hard. Sure, <laughs> sure, I can imagine. So stick with something huh. very simple, like okay. um, just a simple to-do list or oh, smart. a calendar app, something like okay. really basic, and try to build it in the language that you're trying to learn. And okay. that's going to get you um, those smaller bit-by-bit -bit accomplishments as you go along. Okay, that's good. So don't try to make the new Netflix. Right. Just go for the <laughs> next to-do list. Okay, just check Keep in my mind. Keep it simple. Keep yeah. it simple. Okay, I like that. It's really smart. Thank you so much, Cipriana, for coming on our show today. And don't go away because when we come back, Cipriana is actually going to take us to code school. Yeah.
Okay, and we're back. So, code camp, who's ready for camp? Yeah, I'm ready for camp. So today we're gonna learn about JavaScript and Cipriana Ingalls, she's gonna give us the ins and outs using a W3Schools tutorial, which you at home can also follow along. Hi, I'm gonna show you how to make tabs using JavaScript. So if we get into this example, uh, this example that I have here is based on something that I pulled from W3Schools. Uh, that's a great resource that you can use to get into um, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. There are examples out there free and open for anyone to use if you're just learning how to program. So the example I have here has three tabs listed, and when I click on each one of these, it will show the corresponding information. So um, you can see if I click here on the Calypso tab, then I see the information for that, and so on and so forth. So in this example, I'm showing the file using um, just the basic file path to where I've written this code in my index.html. And this is in a Chrome browser, but you can really display this in any browser that you'd like to. Getting into where the code is actually written, I have this in VS Code, which is um, an editor that I like to use, but you can really use whatever editor you'd like. Um, if we look at the file structure, I have index.html. Again, that's what I referenced in the browser. You don't have to be connected to the web in order to get this to display locally. Um, and then I have a script.js, which is where all of my um, JavaScript is at to make these tabs function. And then a style CSS, which is just the basic styling that you saw on the web page um, for the colors and whatnot. So in the header tab, I'm pulling in the style sheet, and then using the script tab, I bring in the script.js file um, where all the JavaScript is living. If we look here at the uh, HTML content, first thing I have is three different um, buttons that are on here. And these are actually the tabs that I showed you in the, in the example, and they are just the names Harry, uh, Calypso, and Pug. In each of these buttons, there are a couple of different things that I've included um, to make these tabs function. The first is a class. Now I've added the class that has the same exact class name on all three of these buttons for two different reasons. The first of those is that if you are styling it, um, you can use one class name and it will style all of the buttons exactly the same. The second is that built into every uh, web browser is JavaScript, which is what uh, makes this programming language so powerful. Um, there is a document object that has uh, JavaScript built into it. So I can use JavaScript to get all the elements that have a particular class name. So in this case, if I want to look for everything that has the class name tab links, then I can use the built-in JavaScript into your browser to grab all of these elements at once. So that's the first thing I've added to all of these buttons to make it function. The second thing I have here is an on-click event. Now the onclick event is um, called show pet. I've defined this in my JavaScript file, and then I'm passing in two different parameters to the onclick event. The first is the event object, and that's the actual click when I click on those buttons. So if I clicked on the uh, tab for Calypso, then it will pass in that event that I've clicked on that tab to this onclick event. Um, and then the second one is a parameter called Calypso, Harry and Pug. So each one of these is unique based on the information that I'd like to display. And corresponding with these three tabs is the tab content. So that's where I'm actually showing the pictures of my cats and the information about them. So each one of these is just a basic div element. It has an ID. The ID corresponds to the tab and it corresponds to the parameter that I'm passing in to the onclick event. And then I've given these also the same exact class name for the three of these. So these all should pull up together if I'm trying to find them using JavaScript. And then within this div is just the basic information that I want to display on my tab content. So now diving into the JavaScript file, we can see that I have just have a few lines of code here, very basic, easy to make these tabs work. Um, I've named a constant called show pet. And again, I've passed in two different parameters to that function. Now the first is that event, that click event when I click on it, and then the second is tab name, and that's Harry Calypso or Pug. 
And then when I get into the function, the first thing that we're going to do is again, that reference the document and then get all the elements by a class name. So this is built into um, your browser, JavaScript that you can use, and it's going to pull back everything that has the class name tab content. So if I go over here and I'm looking for everything that has class name tab content, I can see there's three different cases here. So I should get three elements back. And I'm gonna store all of those elements into tab content. That's the name of my variable. And so when I get this back, I'm going to have them stored in a list, and the list might look something um, like this, A, B, and C. And then I wanna do something to that list. So I wanna go over each item in the list and do something. And the way you do that in JavaScript is called a for loop. And a for loop in JavaScript starts with uh, the word for, and then you have parentheses, and you pass in three different parameters, and then you have the brackets. And anything you want it to do to each of the items goes between your brackets. And so in this case, the first thing that we need to do, the first parameter we're passing in is the I parameter. And that's usually, um, that's a name variable. You can name it whatever you'd like, but we usually name it I because that stands for index. And we're gonna use this parameter as the index for the files or for the array that we're going to iterate over. So we're starting with the number zero because JavaScript is a zero-based index language. So the next um, parameter here that we want is the condition. So while this condition is true, then we go down here and complete this line of code. If this is not true, then our loop is over. So we're looking at tab content dot length and tab content again is this variable that I've called out here that finds the elements by class name. So if I look at the length of tab content, that is equal to three. So while zero is less than three, I'm gonna come down here and complete this line of code. And then I'm going to add one as the last part of this. That's what the plus plus stands for. So then once I add one, I'm gonna start back over here at the beginning of my loop. I is already initialized and now it has a value equal to one. So if one is less than tab content length, which is still three, then we're gonna come down here and run this line of code. So on and so forth until this condition in the middle is no longer true. So for each of these tab contents, what I'm actually doing is I'm going to find the tab content in the list based on the index that we're currently on. I'm gonna set the style of that element that we found, and then I'm gonna set the display of it to none. So we're actually gonna hide any currently showing tab content. And that's all we're doing in a for loop. We're gonna use the same exact model below to iterate over each of the tab links. So those are the buttons that we clicked on. Again, we named them all the same class so I can get elements by class name using our document object. And then I'm gonna store them in a variable called tab links. I'm gonna use the same exact function um, setup to iterate over this new list called tab links. And I'm going to look at the class name that I've given tab links. Now I've set a class name active in my style.css and all that's doing here in the CSS is giving it a new background color of light gray. So if any of my current tabs have an active class, I wanna replace that active class with this, which is just an empty string. So all that's doing is going to take off the active class and remove it. So now the final thing that I wanna do is use a new uh, method within my document object, and I'm going to get an element by ID, and I'm gonna use this tab name that I passed in. So in this case, this would be Calypso, Harry, or Pug. And I'm gonna find the element that has the ID. So if I come back over here, I can see this first one has an ID of Calypso. So if I clicked on that tab, it should find this element. And then all I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna again look at the style. I'm gonna set the display to block. And that is actually gonna show that tab content. And then finally, I'm gonna take the E, which is the event object. Um, that click event, and uh, the current target value of that object is what I have clicked on. So in this case, it's the button that I've clicked on. And then I'm gonna add the class name active back onto the tab that I've clicked on. So that just shows us that now I know I've cleared off all the other tabs, I've cleared off everything, and I'm setting the currently clicked on tab to the active element. So if we look at this again in the final example, and I'll just refresh the page here, you can see and follow along in what we have here. Here are my three tab contents classes that I wanna show when I click on the buttons. And then here are my three buttons, again with the class name tab links. And then I have those on click events where I'm passing in the name or the IDs. So if I click on Calypso here, then we should see that 
Calypso goes to Display Block, so I can see the corresponding information here, while the other tab contents go to Display None. And then I've added the class name Active to this first tab. And that's all there is to make tabs work in JavaScript. Thank you so much for following along. Wow, thank you so much, Cipriana, for that wonderful tutorial. And if you're wondering, hey, that's not too hard, I can do that too. Well, this is for you, Prairie Code Challenge. Send us your code from JavaScript, and you might be featured on the show, and you might even win something. All right, you guys, it's been a wonderful time being with you today. And before we go, I want to highlight some of the things that are happening in Omaha area. So let's take a look at our community calendar. This week, coming up, we have Layout Builder in Drupal 8 at Do Space. We also have Improving Enterprise Architecture Skills for the Omaha Area Professionals, very long title, but also very informative. We also have Audacious Agile. Agile is a huge buzzword, and if you want to know what in the world is Agile and what does it have to do with software development, this group is for you. We also have Learn Swift, and this is an Omaha monthly meeting. And we have Workday, a side projects club. So if you're thinking, hey, I want to do your code challenge, but I don't have any time or I need someone to help me, this place is wonderful because everyone there is working on projects and you can work on your project too. And the last event that we have coming up is Agile Coaching Circles, a bi-weekly virtual meetup. And this is wonderful because it's online. You don't have to worry about the traffic jams. You don't have to worry about going to the gas station. You can do it right from your own home and you can still be coding. So if you want to learn more about Prairie Hub Tech, follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, and we're on Twitter, and we want to get to know you. So hit like, hit subscribe, make a comment. We love it, and we hope to see you on our next episode. Thank you, and have a wonderful evening.